So the 19th century launches with this kind of visual cacophony taking place. On the one hand, as Marx and Marx's theorists would tell us, there is this push of romanticism, whether one looks at the Salisbury Cathedral, um, shown in the PowerPoint slide we've just looked at, or even the more extreme melding of cathedral, God, and nature that we see in the Caspar David Friedrich painting of the phenomenally beautiful kind of cathedral ruin in the mountains surrounded by nature. We see a huge tension between ideas about society and civilization as they're really happening in life and this phantasmagorical romanticist view of the natural world being a kind of perfect marriage for humanity. The critique we see about the 19th century that really has legs for us even still holds that the anxiousness and uncertainty, the tension and inquietude about that period that so many people had as industry expanded and then exploded all over England and then France and Germany and even eventually Russia, that opening of the economy and that push toward imperialism all over Africa that defines 19th century ways of living and making money, those things are still at odds with what people believe about politics and about the potential for art to make life better. And so it is that the dying stages of romanticism, at least in France, but also true elsewhere, the end game of romanticism that Marx would look at is reached at a point where it's impossible, it's impossible anymore to paint whimsical scenes of cathedrals and nature joined together when the forces of the real world seem to be intervening in every direction. Two cases in point we just saw on our slides. Theodore Géricault's amazing and powerful painting, The Raft of the Medusa, takes the kind of romanticist edge of nature and its fierce power and now puts human beings not as observers, but as actual people who are victims of the potency nature brings. The Raft of the Medusa was actually an historic example, not the painting, but the story itself of um, a group of three ships, one of which was called the Medusa. And the Medusa foundered off the coast of Africa. And it was an absolute disaster around 1815, 1860, just after the fall of Napoleon Bonaparte. And this ship has important people. It's like a 19th century version of the Titanic, and it's an amazing international story. 150 or so people are pitched in this life and death battle, and a whole bunch of them end up on a handmade raft floating in the ocean. And there's no effort made by any European power to even look for the ship. It's only by chance, about two weeks after the Medusa is wrecked, it's only by chance that it is, the raft is found and 15 people or so are survivors. The rest eaten by sharks, thrown off the raft or cannibalistically eaten by their own fellow passengers. And Jericho is this young artist wanting to make a name for himself. And he's trying to think of what to paint around this period. And he's thinking, do I do an Alpine landscape? Do I go to the sea? Do I embrace this sort of romanticist movement that is so major already in Germany, so major already in England? Or do I do something that feels important and new? And he paints the raft of the Medusa and he takes nature and puts it in this human story. And the painting is so jarring and it, it pulls together so many different threads of a statement about life in the moment of 1815, it makes an immense impression. 
and it causes a huge stir when it debuts in Paris. Everyone wants to see it. He studied immensely how bodies decay like they would have on this raft. He has gone to the morgue in Paris and dissected bodies to understand the sinews and the muscles and the bones and to get it just exactly academically right. It's a jarring painting, to say the least. But it also is this change moment for art because the relationship between art and technology has reached a point already by 1820 that it's not possible for really critical thinking artists to just embrace a simple unconsidered romanticism where nature is God. No, there are too many ways in which human beings and their lives are at play in this fledgling world of industry that is the reality of Europe in the 1820s and after. And then the other painting we see or have just seen in our slide by Eugène Delacroix, Liberty Leading the People. This is a painting from 1830 that follows the second French Revolution that happens in 1830. And Interestingly and powerfully, Delacroix, the young painter who has studied Jericho and has looked a ton at the Raft of the Medusa, he puts at the center of his story a feminine version of the French nation, known colloquially, colloquially all over Europe as Marianne or Marianne. And she's there with her breast bared, holding the French tricolor and leading the revolution for the people and making manifest in her corporeal kind of self the power of the ideas that underlay this revolution that happens in just three days in 1830, sweeps out one king and brings in another. So it's not really an exciting revolution. In fact, perhaps the most exciting thing about the revolution for posterity is going to always be Delacroix's amazing painting. The point I wanna make here for us is that this particular and powerful medium, the medium of painting in large format canvases becomes so incredibly important during the period around the French Revolution and after, not just in France, but all over the continent of Europe. It drives forward the intellectual movement of romanticism and it ushers in with what Delacroix paints in 1830 with liberty leading the people Delacroix himself is an absolutely avowed romanticist. He believes in the tenets of romanticism, but he also believes in the incredible importance, not of the collective group, not of the nation, which he paints, by the way, in this painting, but the importance of the individual. That is Delacroix. He is not a sentimental romanticist. He's not painting just merely beautiful scenes of the outdoors and positioning nature as this kind of thing to be admired and, and walked within. His story of nature is a story of human beings and civilization. And Delacroix's personal story is fascinating in its own right. Not long after painting Liberty Leading the People, the painting's bought by the French state. And for a long time, it is displayed in the Louvre and elsewhere as this glorification of the power of the idea of France. But Delacroix himself tires of romanticism. He's always an artist who believes in music. He has to have music around and attend concerts all the time. He has this incredible need, like I try and talk to y'all about in our class, about travel and exploration and growth and constantly thinking outside of the box. And so it is that he begins a long trip finally towards Spain and then across the Mediterranean. And he goes to Tunisia, Algeria, all over Morocco and North Africa. And his goals are many. He wants to see the exotic world of people and spices and foods and seasides and sand and camels and all of the animals and society that are all over in this Muslim part of North Africa. And he also wants to have from that exposure and from that experience, an invigoration of his own ideas as an intellectual and a new sense to come, he hopes, from this travel of who he can be and how he can step up higher and dream bigger and paint more brightly and powerfully about the world that's emerging in the 1830s 
the 1840s and after. And Delacroix does achieve that greatness in many ways, but in many other ways, he never does anything to equal liberty leading the people. And that's a common thing we find with not many artists, that they achieve some moment of terrific greatness and they make a statement. In Delacroix's statement, as Marxian critiques would have it many, many years later, Delacroix is looking at a particular moment in time and history, and he's painting a revolutionary experience, and he's bringing to it this power, this unstoppable energy that change will come, that change will be born ahead. No matter how many die on the barricades of change, there will always be new soldiers, new foot soldiers for an idea whose time is right and whose energy is true. Delacroix in the middle of the century would give three years to painting a series of frescoes on the walls of a small chapel at the back of the Saint Chapelle in Paris. We've talked about this chapel already in the context of the so-called rose line from the Da Vinci Code. So we've mentioned this chapel before. But one of the things I've seen time and time again as I've taken students of history, culture, and visual things into this chapel, you can walk right through the incense and the fog of the chill of this space in the early spring or the late fall. And you follow the candles and you follow the stained glass window and the light that shines through to a tiny back chapel where Delacroix painted for almost two and a half years. And the dampness in the church and the tremendous difficulty he faced in making these massive, large format fresco paintings on the walls of the chapel at the Saint Chapelle. I'm sorry. Uh, the difficulties he faced in painting were such that it almost literally killed Eugène Delacroix. He repaired himself after this massive commission was finished and went on with his life and passed away not so many years after completing the commission. But the magic of seeing Delacroix, not the revolutionary painting of liberty leading the people, which you can still see in Paris too, but these quieter frescoes that are about spiritual growth, that are about the kind of opportunity that humanity has to embrace change and make things anew. Uh, it's, it's an amazing moment to go and see the Delacroix paintings. So finally, what can we say about Karl Marx? What can we say about technology, visual art and change? I think what we can say are the following things. Following on the backs of romanticism, following on the work of Jericho in particular, but also of Delacroix, we reach a moment by the midpoint of the 19th century where even the hard critical romanticism of Jericho and Delacroix, those things are not enough. Now we see the Marxian wheel of historic and art change reaching a stage where a brand new aesthetic is born around the middle of the 19th century called realism. And realism grabs a hold of the concept of large format painting just as aggressively as the romanticists had before. And so now we see amazing works by other terrific artists. And they're no longer putting nature at the center of things at all. They're not even putting the stories of notable human beings like the survivors of the Raft of the Medusa or the revolutionaries of 1830 on a central stage that can be painted. In fact, to the realists who come after Delacroix, the idea of painting specific human beings whose stories are known about either as iconography, they're so well known like Jesus and, and the Madonna, or they're simply known by historic fact, it's anathema to what the realists have in mind. Their project instead is to ennoble and rise up the common human being and their suffering. They work with their hands on their hands and knees. They find dignity in what it is they do on the land or in buildings or in factories. And they show up to the 19th century viewer what that viewer's smug comfort is built upon. It's built upon the unbelievably difficult 
day labor and physical work of a whole massive swath of humanity that lives without comfort, that lives without opportunity, that lives without education, but that has something the Marxian critique tells us is already missing from the educated middle classes and the educated bourgeoisie, as that upper echelon of the middle classes are called at this time. And what are those people missing? They're missing the dignity and the connection to their actual work. And what do they have instead? Marx is clear. They have something called alienation from their labor. They're removed from what it is they're making. And the cost of that remove is the anxiety that doctors first diagnose in middle-class people and the nervousness and the edginess. And finally, the total displacement from a sense of belonging to their own lives and what it is they're making with the money they earn and the jobs they do. So we'll focus on some of those realist paintings next time. But I thank you for your attention today, and I hope you enjoy the slides that I'm going to follow with that make uh, a little bit clearer case, hopefully, for some of what we've just said.